Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is an internationally renowned producer and director of some of the greatest Broadway shows, musical theater productions, and concert tours of our generation. He's been instrumental in bringing some of the most wonderful Broadway shows to audiences throughout North America, including Les Mis, Miss Saigon, Oliver, Song and Dance, and Amadeus, to name only a few. He's worked with some of the greatest music artists of all time, including Barbara Streisand, Julie Andrews, Johnny Mathis, Bette Midler, Bernadette Peters, Ricky Martin, Betty Buckley, Donna McKechnie, and dozens more on their concerts, TV specials, and albums. His career has taken him to the greatest performance venues in the world, everywhere from Royal Albert Hall and Festival Hall in London, and the biggest arenas in the world, to Sydney Opera House, Carnegie Hall, the Metropolitan Opera House, the Hollywood Bowl, and the biggest theaters in Las Vegas. As a writer, he's contributed lyrics to projects for Disney, he's written the liner notes for the albums of many classic musicals, and his interviews with dozens of legendary stars for BroadwayWorld.com are pure magic. He's directed the Chaplin Awards for film at Lincoln Center, honoring iconic stars like Robert Redford, Robert De Niro, Morgan Freeman, and Helen Mirren. He's produced Grammy-nominated recordings and cast albums. And in addition to all of his professional activities, he's one of the most passionate and dedicated philanthropists in the entertainment world. In fact, he's absolutely ferocious about giving back. He's a longtime board member of Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS, and has directed many benefit shows, not only for that organization, but for many other causes that are near and dear to his heart, including Animal Welfare, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the Actors Fund, the National Asian Artist Project, Broadway Dreams, and Hollywood's Motion Picture and Television Fund. He's also very active in teaching and mentoring young talent, and he's been the camp director of Kristen Chenoweth's Broadway Boot Camp. And because we have so many mutual friends, I happen to know that he loves schnauzers, he hates crying babies on airplanes, and he's just relocated to Palm Springs where the wind continuously blows his lawn furniture into his pool and into his neighbor's yard, which is very annoying. I'm delighted to welcome the one and only Richard J. Alexander to our show. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Wow, that was some intro. Even I'm impressed. <laughs> well, you know, Where did Richard, you get the information about the wind blowing and the schnauzer. Who do we know? The, who do we know? We know a lot of people in common. So oh, I love you already. Oh, there you go. All right, and I see my the playbills behind you. Wow, this is pretty classy. Happy Easter, Ramadan, Passover. You know, they all aligned this year. So whatever anybody's celebrating, I'm thrilled to be here. And I know a lot about you too. So this is. Very fortuitous today. And I'm very honored. You know, your career has been an absolute dream come true on so many levels. And the thing about you that really shines through for me is that you totally understand the careers of the artists you've worked with. You're a fan and you get the context of every project you collaborate on with them. And it really shows. And to me, that makes you very special. I think it's essential, actually. It's so interesting. You should pick on that. Nobody's ever really sort of nailed that. But you know, I missed the golden age of musicals by a decade, but I got to work with all those people because they were still working on Broadway. So even though I wasn't there for the height of it, I got to work with all the legends. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be working with Cheetah Rivera uh, celebrating the, the 20th anniversary of Broadway World. And she was my first famous friend when I moved to New York in the fall of 1975. And she was in Chicago on Broadway. My friend was her dresser. And I got to meet her and, you know, all these years later, and she's what, 95. And, you know, it's, uh, it's just amazing. We're all friends. Is she 95? Am I making that up? Or is she 90? She's in her early 90s, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, but talking to you, I mean, when you put it all together like this, I don't really think about it too much. But I can say this, you are looking at somebody who all his dreams have come true and more. So it's icing at this point. And I'm going to be 70 in May. And it's just, you know, I don't have any issues with that. But it's just like, I don't know where it went. You know, when you're chasing it, the time disappears, you're hungry. Now, you've sort of done it. And you're, you know, sort of, you know, floating and doing picking and choosing. But it's, uh, it's been a remarkable career. Yeah, because I did all aspects. That's why Cameron McIntosh and I 
were so similar in the respect of we worked our way up. You know, he would sweep a floor or be a stage manager. I was a stage manager. I read scripts. I was a dancer. So the more skills you develop on your way in and up, you know, the more rounded you become. And I think you can, it's relatable, but it's in terms of being fans of the people you work with, it's absolutely essential. If you don't know the discographies, the movies, it's not something you study for. It's something that happened to you during your life. And then you get to apply your knowledge, you know, so a Barbara or a bet will say, wow, how do you know about that? Or, and I don't know where I picked it up or where I heard it or whatever, but it became part of, you know, what stayed up here which makes me valuable to them. And there's no school or training you can go to to do what you do. I don't think so. It's like, a, you know, people, it's very, that's another interesting comment. So it's, I'm, a, I'm like a walking busman's holiday. If you go in my living room, there's books and records and things I need to listen to. And so I don't collect coins. I don't go fishing. That's not how I relax. I relax learning more about the business I love and all aspects of it, you know. Who were the mentors in your career, Richard? There were a few. First of all, as early as when I got bit, when my dad took me to see a, a church high school musical, he was big in the church and he was a CPA by trade and he would help them count the tickets and he threw me in the auditorium and Bye Bye Birdie was on the stage. And I was 10 years old and that was the end. And I started going to the library. So the Salve Public Library essential to my learning, understanding lyrics, rhyme, all of that. Then I was in a high school thespian group, the St. Cecilia Players. That's where I learned my timing. And then I started sneaking downtown while I was in high school on the bus and did things like the Me Nobody Knows and Guys and Dolls and Hello Dolly. And, and you know, it became part of how I learned what I learned. And then I studied musical theater. But I remember like my fourth grade teacher, she had been to New York and bought the Music Man, you know. And so she invited me over to her house and I would look at the album and read every word and look at the animated cover and listen. And, you know, back then you could tell the story of a musical by the songs because the songs moved the action. And then by the time I got to, I, I had a couple of good mentors in high school, you know, people like Nick Culinary, Mario DeSantis, uh, Anne Laval, who was at SU, she became a drama coach for me. And when I got to college, it was actually the music department that saved me because I went to school at the height of avant-garde. So everybody, UNESCO, Genet, and I'm like, what about musicals? What about musicals? So I was always going to be a commercial whore, but hopefully with some artistic craft, because I do know my Shakespeare, my Ibsen, and my Shaw. But it was doing the music, you know, it was the music, because uh, I remember my first music course, a singing class, reading music. And I said, do you have to sing one of the art songs? You know, like, dance, dance, fun, chula, mio, can. And she said, no, you can sing whatever you want. So I go in there belting a show tune. Why can't I fall in love? And she flunked me. And I was pissed. I was really angry. And so I went to the head of the music department. And I said, look, she failed me. I know she's mad because I didn't sing an art song, but she told me I could sing whatever I wanted. So he had me sing it for him. He changed my grade to an A. And then he invited me to join a group called State Singers. But what he said in that meeting, I was a freshman in college, what, 18 years old, right? And he said, you could have a career. He didn't say you could make Dean's List. He didn't say you could get an A. He said, you could have a career. Well, that lit me on fire. And I got out of college in three years. And, you know, he was uh, Dr. James Saluri at SUNY Oswego. And he was... He was sort of my salvation. And then the theater department, finally, after I played like a schizophrenic drag queen version of August Strindberg's The Stronger, the theater department accepted me. So it was crazy. It was crazy. And I was nuts already for musicals. So I was doing summer stock every year and I was nuts. I was really nuts. So you mentioned Kristen Chenoweth's Broadway boot camp. If something like that had existed in my lifetime, you know, in my formation years, I, I would be crazier than I am. Like, I would be totally insane. <laughs> You're crazy in the best possible way. And uh, another thing about you, Richard, that I've, you know, I've studied you and I... Clearly, I, wow, I'm impressed. I see that you've managed to strategize your career in such a way that you work primarily with actors who sing. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a strategy as much as that's how I landed because theater was my love. I have to say, like, I used to stage girl groups and everything when I first got to New York and stuff like that. And I did club acts myself, actually, like when I was in Amadeus, I did things after hours because that's what you did back then. 
But it was Bernadette Peters, when she asked me to do the Carnegie Hall concert, uh, which was going to be her solo debut, she had done things, you know, like Anyone Can Whistle or, you know, other things, Sondheim Evenings. But um, it was that experience that changed my entire life in one night. And then we got the Grammy nomination and the New York Times review. And But my whole life changed. And then everybody came chasing me. And the other one that changed my life was doing Polly Bergen when she came out of retirement at age 70. And when the New York Times called it a life force. And that's when the Diane Carrolls and um, uh, some of the older generation women came after me. So they started calling me the diva whisperer. I have worked with plenty of men, you know, whether it's Brian Stokes Mitchell or Ricky or Norm Lewis or Hugh Panet, you know, plenty of them, Sam Harris, Johnny Mathis. But, you know, the the thing about actors who sing is it's a gift, you know, and so and also having lung capacity. I was offered a lot of shows, you know, with lip syncing acts over the years. Do you know what I mean? Like when I did Donnie and Marie in Vegas, they sing live. But I was offered a lot of groups that sing to track or lip sync to track or they do ghost vocals where the ghost vocals are in there and they sing on top of them. But they're very limiting. There's not a lot of room for change or audience, you know, to change the course of the evening. So I have actually turned down a lot of jobs and just said, you know, I have nothing to bring to this party. So that, that's that been an interesting part. It's not that I'm a snob about it, but I, I love talent. Like, it turns me on. Like, I remember asking Barbara one day at rehearsal. I don't know. She was holding a note, a legato note, and just, and then I think there was a key change in it or something. And I was just like, woo, like, I love her so much. I forget she sings, right? And then she sings and you're in the room with the blue eyes and the... You know, it's it's a lot in the best possible way. But I, I asked her one day, I said, what is what does that feel like? Like, like, how do you decide to hold the note that long? And she goes like this, because I want to or because I feel it. It's that simple. It's like intrinsic. And, you know, she's not a studied musical student or anything like that, but her ear is uncanny and. I love learning from musicians. I love learning from musical directors, from, you know, harp. It. Like, I loved hearing what other people hear in their ears. And when I can't tell if somebody's going to go left or right, and I can't predict it and sing along and I get startled, it's, it's a turn on. I can't quite explain it. I have a feeling that the people that you work with are actually energized and inspired by you just as much as you are by them, Richard. It, that's a fact. It, but sometimes, you know, people snap back, you know, like you're, you know, it's, it's rough work. It's not just like, like people say like, oh, what do you mean you direct them? What do you think people just walk out there and sing? So whether it's the clothes, whether it's the timing, whether it's the lighting, whether it's a wall of smoke, you're going to walk through. These things are all very choreographed and planned. And sometimes things don't work. Like you'll imagine something, you know, again, just going to Barbara, not to name drop, but, you know, uh, we'll have an idea and then like, she'll make it better or reverse the order of two songs and a scene that I imagined. And, you know, imagine standing in front of her and performing, you know, how it would work, you know what I mean? And she's your audience and it's, it's quite exciting or sitting across the couch from Bernadette Peters or being in a room with Christian Chenoweth and, you know, explaining that you can't crescendo decrescendo at the at the end of every song because then it has no impact. Like, and I don't know where I know these things from. Like you said, there's no education, but over the years, my own taste has developed. And one of the things, especially when you get into the world of ballads, when people say things to you like, everything I sing is so slow. Well, where are the dance singles? But I say, don't ever confuse content with tempo because they're listening to what you're doing or you're known for this. So it's not like the old days where people go like, that's a snappy number, ballad, ballad, snappy, dance, you know, it, those days are gone. You know, just like in Cabaret, when I worked with Lori Beachman and I threw that orange dress on her, I was like banished from Cabaret Kingdom. The press went crazy, but the Cabaret community went nuts because you wear black in Cabaret. And I said, well, who made this rule? You know, and all of a sudden she's in an orange dress and it sort of changed the world. And, it's weird. It's not intentional. It's not being a bad boy. It's just what I see. And by the way, the track record is pretty damn good, but I could just as easily be wrong. And I say to people, I'm going to get hit by a bus soon because it's been going really well, but I, I'm a person of my commitment. And then I ask the actor to commit to me. If you take somebody like Deborah Cox, you know, who's an R&B artist, 
And we were singing things like Strange Fruit, made famous by Billie Holiday, or, you know, SpongeBob SquarePants, because she grew up, you know, washing the dishes while it was blaring in her ear from the kids and stuff. The audience goes with you. You know what I mean? You don't have to be known for one thing. And it's uh, it's very interesting. Or somebody like Bette Midler, who has soul and rock and roll and her dream was to have a mosh pit down there in front of her, you know, and, and we did it like these these dreams, like no dream is too big and you try it. But see, I love rehearsal and a lot of people say they love the process, but they're actually lying. They're so result oriented. They want to do it. They want to show you. And the real and that's mostly with lesser artists, the real artists work. They come to rehearsal to work, you know, not to impress, not to. And and it's and it's a process, and I love getting there, and it's ever changing. Like any good artist will never do the same thing twice. Well, I got to tell you, yeah. there there was a moment in the last Barbara Streisand tour where uh -huh. all of her albums showed up on the screen, yeah. <laughs> and I thought you were brilliant because all of us fans remember each of those albums. We yeah. remember that stage of our lives when we bought those albums. Yeah, yeah. That well, was so well done, Richard. Well, that was an accident. Like we just did it. Like Barbara coming to sound check every day is a joy and we work things out and we try things or maybe I'll get an idea. We're going to play Paris. And I hear that Charles Aznavour and Michelle Legrand are coming. I go, oh, let's do the summer of 42. She goes, what? I've never sung it live, but I can do anything. I can pick any key. I can, you know, because I have copyists with me. And, everything. and these are the things. So one day I just decided to load all those albums in with my video guy and Jay Landers and I were, and she walks in and the wall was full of her albums and she was overwhelmed. It wasn't planned. It was not part of the gig, but we loved it. And I love those pictures that exist. And she's done a lot of albums, you know, so, and I, I'm with you. I own those albums. I still have the vinyl. I know every scratch on the Barbara Joan album or the What About Today album. So when I hear them on CD or it's clean or it's streaming, it doesn't sound right. I need my scratches. You know, I think you know, Richard, that our show is filmed in Toronto and you are a hero here in Canada because you directed the Canadian debut of Les Mis and a cross-country tour, which featured the very first ever bilingual company in Montreal That's right. that did the show in French, correct? Yeah, it was in both languages. So uh, starting with the Mervishes and Ed was alive then and so was his wife, Anne, and the son, David. The, they, with Cameron McIntosh, the task was, because Cats had some Canadians, but it also had Americans. So we were, the task was to have an all Canadian cast. And we paid a lot of attention and Claude Michel and I came and we opened at the Royal Alex. It was a triumph. And the Mervishes loved the show and they were very, very loving producers. So they toured us across Canada. You know, we played Vancouver and Calgary and Winnipeg and uh, it was fascinating. And, and I loved it. And Michael Burgess, who I think passed away, was the original Jean Valjean and Louis Pitre. Anyway, when Montreal came, uh, it was during the Iran-Iraq war. I'll never forget. And it was winter, winter in Montreal. And I went there and five performances a week had to be in French and three in English because of the way they do things there. And it was, it was at the Théâtre Saint-Denis. And um, uh, Robert Marianne walked in. He was the last audition on the last day and it was his birthday. And I fell in love with him. And he ended up playing Valjean, Mireille Thibault, and I just, just a brilliant, brilliant cast. But behind, in the orchestra pit with the conductor, it would say Anglais or a Francais, so that the cast would remember what language. But they all had to be totally bilingual. Now, and the staging varied a little bit, subtly, because I couldn't land a joke in French and have the physical staging if the words weren't there. So I had a literal translation of each line of lyrics so that I could do it. But that was a great experience. And I really got to see Canada and, you know, the Laurentian Mountains and Banff. And, you know, it's so beautiful. And I remember driving cross country. It was quite intoxicating. It was around the time that the Thelma and Louise movie came out. So Keith Batten, my co-director, and I, we were just playing Thelma and Louise, you know, and just pulling over on a highway and diving in beautiful rivers. It was quite, it was quite beautiful. Canada is beautiful and the people are beautiful. Well, we love you here. I think you've directed 11 productions of Les Mis. Is that your favorite Broadway show? Yeah, I mean, I would have to say that, you know, my favorite Broadway show is MAME. That's the first show I saw on Broadway. And I couldn't 
but understand the gl- I just couldn't understand what was happening in front of me. And I knew I was coming to New York. I was 14 years old when I saw my first show on Broadway and my parents took me to New York. But Les Mis is such a huge history and how it happened after working on Song and Dance. And Cameron told me about it. And I was in Santiago, Chile, directing Amadeus in Spanish. And I said, who's going to direct this? And he said, I've asked Trevor Nunn and John Caird. And I said, can you get me an interview? So I flew over to England. I never could have imagined. However, when I saw it, and it got you know very mixed reviews to negative reviews at the Royal Shakespeare Company, and it moved into the Palace Theater in the West End, and I flew over to see it. And I remember during Red and Black, I couldn't breathe. Like, I really couldn't breathe. And because I had read the novel re- in recent, recently before I saw it, Victor Hugo spent so many time, so much time with all those characters, all those young kids. You know, they were schoolboys, never held a gun. Comfere and Koferak and Fouilly. He loved them so much that he described them so beautifully because he knew that he was going to kill them on the barricade and it had to matter. And I'll just never forget, like I still get emotional about it. <clears throat> and so I would always try to bring that to the story. And also we had such a talent pool in America, you know, when it was originated at the uh, RSC and moved into the West End, you know, they have one production, maybe a tour. North America was a beast. You had to feed it. And so after you worked with the known talent, I had to develop a whole talent pool, a generation of a talent pool. And I discovered a lot of people but I had the machinery behind me and the faith of Cameron McIntosh that, you know, I went to Nashville, I went to Branson, Missouri, I went to Las Vegas, you know, I found people all over the place, Disney World, because I had to feed the beast, you know, and I'm very proud, of, particularly of those first 10 years of all the talent, because it wasn't enough to be a good singer, to be in Les Mis, you had to have a soul. And I remember I used to say that to people, and there's only so much you can find out in three to five minutes, but I could say I can count the mistakes on one hand, where I got what I saw and it never grew. You know, you get what well, you see, what you get, or you get, we see whatever. It's a pretty uh, damn good track record. I'll tell you. It is a pretty damn good track record. As a matter of fact, today on my Facebook, I posted from 1991, somebody sent me the last scene, somebody posted it and I'm sitting here crying and it's Gary Morris and Susan Gilmore from Canada. And it's so beautiful in that black box, you know, with all that light it's just, it's a majestic staging that Trevor and John created. And of course, they learned their lessons of this kind of uh, staging when they did Nicholas Nickleby, which I had seen when I was in Amadeus when it came to Broadway. So, so yeah, you're making me flash back. I'm having an acid trip right now. It's a <laughs> well, lot. Like, I don't even remember how this all happened, you know, and where I got the energy, you know? I think you were born with the energy for 10 people. Oh, now, wow. you talked about Barbara Streisand. Of course, everyone knows about her brilliance, her talent, her meticulous attention to detail. It's monumental. If I were to ask her what particular skill set you bring to the table for her, what do you uh, think she would say that she appreciates the most? I think I know the answer to that, actually. I mean, she loves me and knows I'm smart, but I think it's the energy you know, that I bring to the day. And she likes my energy. I think on the first thing she ever wrote to me, she said, I like your style or something. And I sort of gave birth in 2000 to Team Barbara, you know, to making us all, you know, working towards the same goal. And I don't feel like I'm overprotective, but I just, you know, and I push, you know what I mean? And I bring up a lot of music that might never have been considered, but because I know the discography, like when I said, she wrote a song called Ma Premier Chanson, I love Jean Mappel Barber, and I said, would you ever consider sitting at the piano and doing it? And she did in 2000, she took her glasses off the thing, and she, you know, Michelle Legrand taught her at the piano. And these things are beautiful. I actually had her with a guitar at one point, but it involves cutting your nails you know, which she did for the film. And it would have been too much to do the piano and the guitar. So we cut the guitar and we gave the guitars to, they were the original style guitars. We gave them to El Devo as a gift on opening night. But she's a remarkable collaborator. And when you speak with her, I'll say like, you know, I'm not selling you. She goes, no, sell me, sell me. And I'm passionate. So I think the passion to answer your question And I think my energy that I come in and because I don't really plan a day. I don't do things on paper. And she'll ask, what are we doing today? And the day unravels, but I take it off of her energy 
but the voice, the voice after all these years to have that full range, you know, she never drank or did drugs or did anything self-damaging. And she's going to be 81 in April, which is shocking to me because you look at those blue eyes and the, you know, it's, it's a lot. And she's Barbara Streisand. I mean, even I, I think like that, but I love her so much and she's so funny. And I saw her just before Christmas, you know, we hadn't seen each other since COVID and uh, I didn't want to let go of her, you know, because it had been so long. Do you I want like me to tell so you what I think? That What do you think? I think it's your positivity that's in that energy. It's healing. I guess. I mean, I don't think, you know, I definitely, I, I'm critical of so much and I have so many opinions, but I can back them up. So I'm not jaded. That's the beauty of me for sure. But I definitely have a take on things. And I've always been worth my opinion. Even Cameron said that. And he also knew I didn't lie. So good news, bad news are indifferent. But there's good energy. But she's got great energy. And, you know, when she kicks in, like she goes out there to win it. You know, she goes out there to win it. When we started doing gypsy run-throughs and stuff, she's just, you give her people and she can, you know, no pun intended, and she, you know, can work the room. She's beguiling. She's she's magical. She's mystical. Those eyes kick in and it's entrancing. And sometimes I just go like this. It's sort of like the same thing happened when we were on tour. We opened in Chicago with the Kiss My Breast tour of Bette Midler. And, you know, this is an album I grew up on, you know, probably getting high, smoking pot. Um, in the 70s at college and listening to the Divine Miss M. And and to have her sing Skylark with just a piano in an arena, even though we have all the big special numbers, I would sit on the road, the road box over by the sound deck, and I would just cry going, what is happening here? Like, this is not possible because if you went into my childhood bedroom and you have Liza and Bernadette and Barbara Cook and Barbara Stark. You know, all, there must have been some bizarre law of attraction seriousness going on in my bedroom because I grew up in a town this big, you know, and people made fun of me, of course. And now they want to throw you a parade. and You want to go, yeah, sure. You know, or I always knew you'd make it. And it's easy to say in hindsight, but it was tough. It was very tough growing up being me and having the passion I did. But my dad was so smart because he was an educator also. And he saw the passion and he would buy me the Sunday New York Times for a quarter. And I would slave over that arts and leisure section. I go, Ma, the Andrews sisters are in a musical called Over Here. We got to go to New York. Like I was, cr they didn't know what the hell to do with me. They would drive me to Illinois, to Southern Illinois University to do summer stock. It's insane. Like where were my other brothers and sisters? I'm one of five. I feel like I got so much attention. And of course, they feel the same for them, but it, it's a remarkable, I wouldn't change anything. Yes, I sold shoes, kids' shoes at Macy's. I was Christmas help at Brentano's and Tiffany. I worked at Spaghetti Works. You know, it's not like it all just magically happened. I read scripts for $5 an hour for Joe Papp at the public. I, I just wouldn't change it. I, I wouldn't change a single thing. You know, there were no contests in YouTube and you know, you had to work, you had to work and you had to learn and you had to have some value for your dollar. Even reading music, like when I was the second, the first ASM of Song and Dance, it's Andrew Lloyd Webber, right? So act one is Bernadette. That's where our friendship was made back in 1984, 85. And act two is variations on a theme, Julian Lloyd Webber with Andrew and dance but you had to be able to read music to call the cues or you could crash some serious scenery right so you'd be turning and double bars and so even learning to read music helped me get work even speaking spanish sent me to other countries you know to madrid to mexico to santiago chile you know so it all becomes a part of you you know what i mean and also in a weird way spanish isn't even a second language anymore in the united states you know richard you have enormous resilience. Mm. Where does it come from? I always had to shield myself because of all the making fun of. There was no words like bullying back then. You just got beat up. I still have a chip in my tooth, which every time I go to the dentist all these decades later, would you like to fill that? No, I want to remember where I came from, you know, and people made fun of me. You know, I could cry if I actually think about it. And there's been plenty of therapy but I, I think I've always protected myself from harm 
because there was no one to protect me. And also during those days, you know, this 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, you didn't want to tell your parents you were being bullied at school. You didn't want to go down the wrong hallway. These these things were pretty terrible. So I found my tribe, and this is what I try to teach young people. I found the people where I felt safe and I surrounded myself with that, you know, and that's how I thrived. But I definitely had to block out reality for sure. And then the other thing is, I guess I've never been afraid of no, because no allows you to take a left turn and continue forward. People that live in limbo that go, oh, I haven't heard yet, or I'm still waiting or whatever. And it all seems very odd to me. Everybody's afraid. And I was always fearless. That's for sure. And I was also always independent. My dad even told me that on the first day of kindergarten, I would, they couldn't find me in the house. I was already at the bus stop, but I was in my pajamas. I didn't know you had to wear clothes to school, right? And so, you know, and I left home for college at 17 or 18. And then I got out of college at three years and I left my family crying in the driveway in Salve, New York, while I drove to California to start my career because nobody actually went to New York where I went to college. So there were no upperclassmen. People went to college, they went to grad school, and then they taught. So they had no practical experience. So I felt a little robbed in my education. And it took me a couple of years to get my feet wet. But luckily, I started in the West Coast production of The Boys from Syracuse. Then I got scouted for another show. And I worked the box office for P.S. Your Cat is Dead and made James Kirkwood. And I saved $2,000 and I moved to New York, you know. And I sometimes I didn't know where my next meal was coming from. I remember rainy Fridays, like I would need new headshots and I wanted to buy a bicycle so I could save subway fare. And I don't know. It's it, I don't know. It's a miracle I'm here, actually. Well, you know, uh, you and I have a lot in common because of what we went through as kids. And I can tell you that success is the best revenge. I feel like that, you know, it's sort of like uh, listening to Barbara's story, you know, growing up in Brooklyn and, you know, then people saying, get your teeth fixed, get your nose straightened, you know. And I think about her very often because she lived in Brooklyn and she's watching the Ed Sullivan show on the TV, knowing that all of that is just on the other side of that bridge. It must have seemed like Oz when she got on that subway. But the hunger in her and the drive is unmistakable. And I don't think it's any accident that we met in this life, you know? And we'd met in the 80s when I was an actor. Amy Irving was in Amadeus and Amy came to work one night and she goes, oh, I turned on some Jewish thing today with Barbara Streisand. I go, what Jewish thing? And she says, something called Yentl. I go, Yentl? Yentl the yeshiva boy? Are you crazy? The play, you know, was fantastic. You go read. And then Amy got the part. And so when she was shooting in like Reykjavik or wherever, Prague or wherever they were, she would come back to New York and stay with me on my couch on 55th Street. And I would ask every question about what's it like to work with her? What, you know, and, you know, so, but Barbara took, well, she was taking Amy to dinner after the show with Sis Corman. They were going to Orso and Amy asked if I could go with her, with them. And, <laughs> you know, what am I? How old am I? I don't know, not even 30, maybe. And, and I'm like this. You know, like, I don't think I said a word. And years later, you know, when we met and she sent her manager to meet me in 1993, I was turning, I don't know. It's it's pretty damned extraordinary how everything aligned. And, you know, when people use the word lucky, I sort of resent it. I, you know, I earned it and I think I'm talented for sure. But a lot of people are talented and it doesn't happen. But I feel like luck has very little to do with it. I think you have to seize opportunities. I wouldn't be a director if it wasn't for Tommy Toon. When I got offered to direct the tours of Amadeus after I'd done it in New York, I saw him at Sardi's and he was in my one and only. And I said, Tommy, I got offered, but I'm, I'm an actor. And he goes, Richard J., you know, after I wanted Tony for Seesaw, I couldn't get arrested until I directed the club. Take the job. And back then it wasn't like open a door. It was like, you got to know when there's a crack in the window and jump through. And I'm going to see Tommy very soon, actually, at the end of this month. But he is the reason I became a director. He was the inspiration. And I'm very, that I'm so grateful for. Just a little piece of advice like that. Oh, for sure. I understand what you're saying about luck. I think there's definitely destiny there. I want to ask you, when you direct a concert tour, for Barbara or any big vocalist, there's obviously things they need in the theatrics to bring those songs to life on the stage and give them the dramatic effect that they want. 
What's the most challenging part of those stage performances for you that you have to do to help them deliver? Well, I don't think it's as difficult as all that, but what you do have to do in the course of an evening with two acts is you have to make it a varietal for the audience. So you're in an arena, sometimes we're doing in the round 360, but different areas and playing and then staging and making space with lighting. So all of that is calculated, but I remember the year I did my first, you know, I inherited the 2000 show, which was timeless. But when I did my first original show with her from scratch, which was 2006, I came out to L.A. to Malibu and I played the overture from Funny Girl, the the Broadway show, which is Ralph Burns orchestration, which is quite thrilling. And she and Marty perked up and you could see tears and they remembered because the movie is so much in everybody's mind and it's so Hollywood. They're in Hollywood now. And then I played the reprise of Don't Rain on My Parade. Because every time you do people or Don't Rain, it's how are we going to do it different this time? So it's not the same. Which orchestration? And she did a reprise of I'll March My Band Down. I'll beat my drum. Da, 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 da. And she goes, what, what is this? I said, it was an act two. She goes, had Nikki come back in? And I said, I don't know. And we got the script. And But when I told her she'd be backlit, Right. And then until we hit her with front light, at least I didn't fake it. She knew exactly. She could see it and she makes it come to life. And then I light it with Peter Morris. It's a very, very exciting. It's a real collaboration. It's not accidental. And you work it and you want to look and we watch it. We film things sometimes and watch to see if they work. Or when we did Funny Lady and I wanted to do How Lucky Can You Get and isn't it better? And she said, let's reverse them. And I said, oh, wow. I don't know. It, it's it's fun being me when you're actually working and, and the days go so fast and you're done and you go, wow. And you get stuff done, but you see it or you build video packages. The other thing is she's a mesmerizing actress and words matter. So she can't do anything that's not truthful. But when I did the Film Society of Lincoln Center, which is now called Film at Lincoln Center, and they attributed her to spend time with all her filmography, it was thrilling for me. That was thrilling. And she had a great night. So she's, you know, she's, I, I dare say, I really mean this in all sincerity. I think she's the biggest star ever of all time in the world. And the fact that we cross paths on this universe, I'm really happy about that and very grateful. And the work we've done together with team Barbara and with us together talking and communicating, you know, who else gets to go on a bus to Niagara Falls, you know, with Barbara on our day off while we're playing Toronto, you know what I mean? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> and we loved having you here, by the way. And Canada was so good to us. They were so good. As Toronto was wild. And so was Montreal and Vancouver. And the, it's just amazing that the love was wild in Canada for her. Oh, that's for sure. Now, you've worked with a lot of great vocalists like Barbara, Lea Salonga, Liz Calloway, so many yeah. others. Yeah. I've always wanted to ask you this. Who are the singers that, in your opinion, have a perfect pop voice? Oh, my gosh. You, how do you know all this stuff? You're freaking me out. So <laughs> I think you know the answer to this. So the perfect pop voice for me of all time is Karen Carpenter. It's just perfect. So what I mean by that is it's seamless, right? So the chest voice into the head voice, I don't know how I know these things. But anyway, when Liz Calloway came along, same thing. Story goes on, baby. Thrilling from chest to head, no break, no break. It's not a, you don't hear the where it shifts. Leia Salonga comes along, right? Who grew up listening to people like Liz Calloway because later I put them on the stage together at Carnegie Hall and Leia Salonga has the perfect pop voice. It's like I'll sit here sing hopelessly devoted to you any day of the week. You know what I mean? But to see Leia when she was young and uh, unbridled because she didn't even understand what she was doing at the time. That's not a criticism. It's just she was so young and just giving it all. And now, you know, like doing that Carnegie Hall concert was a thrill. One of the things about nights like that, which are one night only, is to make the stakes high. And she had told me, she'd called me from the Philippines and told me she was pregnant. So I said, oh my gosh, really? And I said, could we tell the audience? She goes, I don't know, Richard, it's bad luck. And I'll be just at the end of my first trimester. But see, you're looking at a guy right now, everybody, that 
used to hear the story goes on from baby by Malpy and Shire, two of my favorite people ever, but I've heard it in auditions. Nobody was ever actually traveling the road. And Liz was certainly not pregnant when she did it on Broadway. So Leia agreed. And the way I got into it was she had never heard the song married from cabaret. Oh, the world can change. It can change like that with just one little word married so she goes on we wrote this dialogue about you know ever since we got married she introduces her husband rob in the audience everybody says so leah when are you going to have a baby when it not so fast not so well that used to be my stock answer but tonight ladies and gentlemen i can't say that because you are looking at tonight a very happy pregnant girl at the at the end of her first trimester and then the, the orchestra goes da 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 so this is the demo, you know, and she goes, well, chills, the place goes wild, Liz Keller, goes, it's on YouTube, you can watch it, the story goes on with, the, and it's, and sometimes I watch it just to re-inspire myself, because I can't believe I did it, and I called Malpy and Shire, and I said, I want the girls to sing the horns, and I want them to, 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 to ape each other, and they came to the rehearsal and everything, and this is Broadway royalty we're talking about, so these are the crazy crazy things, you know, or Bernadette one night only, or, and, you know, Stephen Sondheim says, I want to come to the rehearsal. And I said, oh, I don't know how I feel about that Bernadette because, you know, we were role reversing. She was singing Joanna and the wolf. And I just didn't want her head messed with, you know? And of course we had a triumph and that night she got offered gypsy and I don't know. So a lot of thrilling, thrilling, you know, sitting with Barbara Cook in her dressing room, Julie Andrews, honestly, somebody needs to slap me. Like I'm sitting here talking, I haven't talked about this stuff in so long. So I'm unloading on you, unfortunately, but I'm uh, loving it. It's yeah, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> it is actually quite awesome. Watch it's a lot of name dropping. It's a lot of name dropping. It's really quite delightful. You are, you're delicious. Oh, as you know, I do a lot of research and you said something once about Bette Midler in an interview I watched that really was jaw dropping to me. You said she's not camp. She's vaudeville. What yeah. did you mean by that? That's true. So back when she first appeared, you know, in the Harlots and the whole thing, you know, you know, she struts. It's a girl act. You know, she struts. And yeah, she is. It's rat tat tat tat. It's delivery. It's. It is. It's a vaudeville skill, you know, and then she can stop and kill a ballad or sing a Rosemary Clooney song or sing a soul song. You know, like I remember when they were, give me that mic. I, I, I got soul, you know, she's fearless. And, you know, her career, again, in the way of being confronted like you being young or me or Barbara, you know, I remember Beth told me the story personally when she was in Fiddler on the Roof. And she needed to make an extra $25 a week. And so she went and had a meeting with Ruthie Mitchell in Hal Prince's office. And she turned her down. And she's like, Jesus Christ, I got to get a fucking job. And that's when she and Barry Manilow went into the baths. And that's what started the Divine Miss M. But it was out of necessity. Like she needed that extra $25. When I did Amadeus, I got the best advice from a guy named Mario De Maria, company manager, who said, Richard, you have a small part. You're an understudy also. Take the second ASM contract. That's an extra $35 a week. You collect valuables, but you get to go to all the understudy rehearsals, and then you can observe and then try to direct the tours. Best advice I ever got. You know, Richard, I'm completely mesmerized, but as I'm listening to you, I'm wondering how much of what you do when you're working with a great star is being a good audience. Uh, well, I think I'm. Uh, I think I am an audience because first of all, I go see everything, so I know what's out there. That's very important to know when people are showing off or pulling theatrics or not singing live. My biggest sin. Everybody I work with sings live, so that's a big plus. But yeah, I think I'm a good gauge, and I think the performers trust me. So. Let's say, like, I remember one day I was talking to Bernadette, and I said, Bernadette, what are you thinking while this is going on? Because usually when things are working, I don't invade that privacy. I don't want to know because I don't want to bring attention to something that's working because then they'll try to recreate it rather than living it, right? 
And she told me what she was thinking. I said, it's not translating. And I call that mirror work where you look at your face and what is it that's not working? I send actors to mirror work all the time. I did mirror work when I went on QVC to uh, sell Love is the Answer because there were no more record stores and stuff like that. So I'm like in the mirror going, is that too much smile? Like, And I, I learned what it felt like to put my mouth. It's like watching a good soap actor or an actor with how does that jaw muscle move when they're upset? Like these are techniques that people do develop. And so, you know, we solved that problem, but it's, uh, it's interesting and no two artists are the same. And you also have to understand the sensitivity of how to bring up issues like this so that nobody gets hurt. Do you know what I mean? But you're investigating, but I usually stay away from the stuff that's working. And I focus on the stuff I need to focus on, especially when you're doing multiple artists or a musical, like you're at the Hollywood bowl or something. And you're getting racehorses to the gate to get them together. So if three of the horses are doing fine, leave them alone for a couple of days and get these horses up, you know, to snuff. So, and that's the way. And then somebody will come to you and go, I feel like you're not paying attention to me or you're not giving me notes. I said, because you're doing fine. Give me a day or two. I'll be back. So it's very interesting. And also it's fragile. But having been an actor and a performer, I think I do a pretty good job of that. However, then there's the extreme actor who will, you know, kill you with, you know, questions and you just want to kill somebody. Not literally, but, you know, you know, it's a it's a lot. It's babysitting sometimes, but not not with the people we've been talking about. You worked with Johnny Mathis on my oh, favorite uh, album, the Broadway, Broadway album. album. Any stories you can tell us about that? Yeah, I can tell you a lot of stories. I can tell you that I cried every day at work. Jay Landers, who brought me to the world of Barbara Streisand, and we met doing cast albums. We did the first cast album we did on Broadway was Five Guys Named Mo. He came to my office. So anyway, he was impressed with me. And then he was doing the Johnny Mathis Broadway. And he goes, you got to meet this guy. And I flew to LA and they hired me. But to be in the control room, with Johnny Mathis in the booth and a full orchestra and people like Jonathan Tunick or uh, Bill Ross, I was crying and Johnny would go, are you okay? I go, yeah, you're Johnny Mathis. Like, it's too much. It's like when you work with big stars or you do Time Heals Everything for the first time with Bernadette Peters or something from Dames at Sea and you remember you were in high school and somebody let you borrow the album and you ran home and heard Peter Patter. It's, it's crazy when something is so identifiable with the song. And, uh, and it comes to life. Working with Donna McKechnie, it's crazy. Play me the music. Give me a chance. It's it's nuts. You know, by Orc Lee, Tommy Toon. It's insane. It's crazy. Now, I don't know if you'll be comfortable answering this question. Okay. But has there ever been a star? I'm not asking for names, but has it ever happened that there's a star that you've refused to work with? Yes. 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 What would uh, make you say no, besides the fact that they don't sing live? No, well, they, they sang live, this one. But what happens is, like, sometimes you get interviewed, right? You don't just get hired cold, right? And I remember one specific interview, and, you know, she's not alive anymore, so I'm not going to talk bad about her. But, you know, and they ask questions, and you can see on the face, you know, because I, do, I don't do reels. I don't send a reel of work because... It has nothing to do. Like I remember when Bette Midler wanted a reel and I said, geez, she's going to see Ricky Martin and Bernadette and Bar, you know, that has nothing to do with this woman. This woman runs around in a fishtail in a wheelchair. And, and also she had been in trouble because she hired the director she currently had from a reel. Reels are editors formats. They don't show arc or how you work. Right. So I wanted to be in the room, uh, but anyway, with this other person and it was almost like she didn't hear what I said. And then my lawyer was called and she still wanted to hire me. But I had called my lawyer after the interview and I said, look, it's not going to work out. She's saying this and this and she's nuts and wants to do this. And, my, and I am not interested. And then she calls on Monday and goes, I want to hire Richard. He goes, well, that's not his understanding of how the meeting went. So I remember like stuff like that. Or sometimes, you know, dare I say some people thought I was too expensive, you know, or, you know, I mean, it's interesting. Do you know what I mean? And it's not always about money, but you can't be stupid either. And the time investment is enormous. And sometimes the exclusivity, you know, is uh, demanded. Do you know what I mean? Where you can't be doing multiple things, right? Or sometimes you're traveling to Europe and you're out of the market for six months. So it's always different. But 
I haven't, but uh, I didn't have any bad experiences because those experiences, those particular ones that I'm referring to never went forward. So I smelled, you know, the coffee, but yeah, it happens. And then, you know, once I thought I didn't get a job and then I got it, but that was after somebody else got fired or, you know, somebody has a bigger name or I remember, yeah, that happened with another big star who's alive and well and thriving. So, but, you know, I thought I had the job. I was told I had the job and then I didn't, you know, so, you know, there's heartbreak, you know, and you wonder why, but you don't go chasing somebody or ask, or, you know, I'm not that person you accept it and you move on and not everybody can do every job. You know what I mean? Well, you've talked a lot and you absorb a lot of the magnificence of the experiences of your life, but have there been sacrifices you've had to make in this career? Oh, of course. Of course. So if you take what I call affectionately the Macintosh years, you know, I was on planes for like 10, 12 years. And, you know, every time you'd meet somebody or you wanted a date or they wanted you to move in or something like, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. The lifestyle wasn't, you know, I was just not good at relationships. So, but I accepted it, but I got exactly what I wanted, you know, or I'm, I'm looking behind you at, you know, these playbills, like I'm remembering Amadeus in particular. Imagine studying Shakespeare on Tuesdays with Ian McKellen before he was knighted and learning the sonnets, right? Or meeting Edward James almost in the 70s, you know, when he came from the West Coast to do Zoot Suit and Lupe Ontiveros and just these amazing experiences of the workshop of song and dance up at Williamstown where we were making maybe $135 a week or Oliver and working with Ron Moody and Patti Lapone and and Lionel Bart was alive, was alive and sitting on a seat in the orchestra. You know what I mean? Or, you know, when AIDS came along, it was during Amadeus. And of course, you know, you thought, oh, my God, am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? And I'll never forget. Uh, and people were dying, but there were no tests yet. And so 1987 is approaching Les Mis, And I remember laying in bed going, God, please just let me live till Les Mis opens. I'll never ask for anything again. And, you know, you meant it because you didn't know, am I going to be struck down, you know, you know, and also AIDS, what it did to the industry, the dance, music, you know, all our worlds is it left open a generation of mentorship. So a lot of people said they're directors, but they never mentored with anybody because a lot of those people who would have mentored, we lost. So that was a very interesting period in time. And then survivor's guilt and and all of that. And, you know, now COVID, it's just, it's remarkable. I'm happy to be around, you know, uh, because it was a time when you thought maybe you wouldn't. But yeah, you, I sacrificed everything to have a career, but it's what I wanted. So I got what I wanted. And I, I never felt the need to be paired to be complete. I'm sort of my own entertainment and my own parade. And the days are full, you know what I mean? Doesn't mean I haven't had playmates, but you know, it's it just it, I'm not good at it. I'm just really not good at it. <laughs> Maybe you're just too much for one person. You were meant for the I, world. I'm too much. I'm too much for me. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> well, you're not too much for me. You've probably discovered more stars than anyone else because you were casting all those Broadway shows. I read that you discovered Leah Michelle when she was eight years old. Yeah, Leah Michelle's a great story, and we're still friends to this day. And it's so odd that she should be in Funny Girl and my association with Barbara and everything. But Leah Michelle is a great story. And anybody who's out here watching, particularly in Canada, when I would have the kids' auditions, and whether it was at the Kennedy Center or Philly, you know, I took kids that were local, right? So Leah Michelle, uh, she's not auditioning for me. She's over here by the wall, but her friend is auditioning, right? And I guess the mother had to pick her up at school because Leah's mom was working or whatever. So she was there for support. So the girl is singing in front of me and not so great. And I'm looking at Leah Michelle and I'm like, uh, so I go, thank you. And I go, what are you doing here? She goes, oh, I'm here for moral support. And I said, well, do you sing? And she goes, yes. I go, would you like to sing Castle on a Cloud? And she goes, okay. Because, you know, everybody knew it back then. It was like the tomorrow of its day. And she sang and I cast her on the spot you know, with the casting director, I was the associate director, executive producer, and they'd never spoke again, those two. So years go on, and there's a very, very famous interview. So she went to Stage Door Manor, she was in Fiddler on the Roof, she was in Ragtime, 
And she's a showbiz kid now. And she's now a teenager, maybe 16 or 17. But since she was 15, was doing the workshops of Spring Awakening. So there's a very famous interview online. It's been seen by millions of people where I interviewed her because I was so pissed off that she didn't get a Tony nomination. I thought she was fantastic in that show. Also, it was very bizarre to see her little titty come out. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's my kid. you know. And I would ask her in the interview, how do you tell your parents to be prepared for this? In the interview, Leah Michelle says to me, Richard J., I would like to play Eponine someday. And I said, well, you're probably not out of chances, you know, blah, blah, blah. Two days later, I get offered the Hollywood Bowl, Les Mis, and I call her. I go, you want to come to Hollywood? And the rest is history. And I did her nightclub act out there at Mark's and Ryan Murphy saw her in Los Angeles and she had her interview at Fox and, and Glee happened. And so we're still friends. So I saw her in the show and it was quite remarkable and I remember kneeling down at her feet and everything. And, uh, you know, backstage was very tricky because of COVID and all that. But I'm really, really proud of her. And the one impression that I remember specifically as I watched is that, boy, she's not a kid anymore. And and that was pretty great. Have you seen it, the new production on Broadway? I have. It was mesmerizing. She's... Did you see Leah Michelle or you saw Beanie? I saw Leah Michelle do it. There's no yeah. words. Yeah. You and know? so, and it's funny because people want me to hate it because of my relationship with Barbara and stuff like that. But, you know, why should it be different than Hello Dolly or Mame or all the people that have played Lear or whatever? But this one was so verboten because Barbara's talent was so huge. And don't forget, the thing that made it unique is like My Fair Lady, Julie Andrews did it on Broadway, but Audrey Hepburn did it in the movie. Vanessa Redgrave did Camelot, not Julie Andrews. You know, so many examples. And then you have, you know, uh, Shirley Jones did the movies, but it was Barbara Cook on Broadway. You're talking about Music Man. Yes, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But see, movie stars were movie stars and TV stars were TV stars and Broadway stars were Broadway stars. I mean, look at Cheetah Rivera and Bye Bye Birdie. You know, they made Janet Lee look just like her you know, with a black wig and everything, because Cheetah wasn't a movie star. Now, I learned recently that Cheetah actually wasn't available to do the movie because we did an interview about a Dick Van Dyke thing. So that was a new story that I learned. And there's always something to learn. It's not exactly the way you see it. But yeah, so anyway, but the whole world met Barbara Streisand as Fanny Bryce. So if you didn't know the records or the nightclub or you didn't see it on Broadway, whether you lived in Brazil or whatever, everybody saw the movie Funny Girl. So she did her own role. Very rare in that time. Even Lucille Ball did Mame or, you know, Joel Gray did. But, you know, Jill Haworth didn't do Cabaret. Liza Minnelli did. <clears throat> so it's a very interesting thing. So everybody loves their Barbara. And, uh, you know, of course. And thank God it's there forever preserved so brilliantly. But that doesn't mean other people shouldn't do it. You know what I'm saying? Look at all the people that were in cabaret during the run, you know, during this most recent run, or in Chicago or whatever. But for some reason, this one was off limits and people wanted me to hate it. And I didn't. And that's the truth. No, I didn't hate it at all. I loved it. When you and I were growing up, Richard, Broadway shows had a huge impact on pop music. That's yes. really not the case anymore. We don't see big hits coming from today's Broadway shows. Why do you think that is? Because radio airplay has changed, you know, the same way as people drop singles and stuff. It's just different. So one of the lessons that Jay Landers taught me about making records when I became a record producer of sorts is that, you know, when you look at an album, you should know, you know, and you're looking at a vocalist, you should know 70% of the titles because everybody sang the same songs. It was the arrangers that were king, Don Costa with Steve and Edie, but everybody was singing the hits, Sunrise, Sunset, you know, this, uh, uh, If Ever I Would Leave You, you know, and Broadway had tunesmiths. And don't forget, a lot of the composers on Broadway, like Cy Coleman and stuff, they came out of Tin Pan Alley. They had written radio hits already for singers and stuff like that. So it was an interesting time. And it's funny because I believe that's the key to like a new Kristen Chenoweth album to sing like the Broadway hit parade. You know what I mean? And it's right in her own backyard because it did used to supply uh, radio airplay, but it's different. And it all sort of ended almost at memory, maybe, you know, with Barbara's Broadway album with, I don't know why I'm frightened, you know, Sunset Boulevard. But yeah, it doesn't yield a lot of hits, you know, even on the Broadway album with Johnny, like we did 525,600 minutes and, you know, something like that. but I wouldn't say that that was a blockbuster radio hit recorded by anybody, you know? And so, it's interesting, you know, and you're right, but the music business has changed. Listen, I can't tell you who's singing half the time when I have the radio on. <laughs> Me neither. You know, you well, know. I've only got one more question for you. Yeah. 
would you ever consider writing a memoir? Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, a lot of memoirs that I've loved by people who shall go nameless, who are alive and well, you know, nobody bought them. And so if they're sort of famous, you know, I think what's the value? I think my value is editorial and, you know, happy to talk about things and stuff like that. But as a collective life, people always say it because they think my life is so exciting, but that's in relation or whatever. And I don't know that there's a lot to glean. And there's, a, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff about the business we're in. Do you know what I mean? Where you just well, watch. That's exactly it. I personally, I'd like to see you do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, when you're gone, those stories will go with you and they are historical. Number mm. two, I do see incredible resilience. You're special, Richard J. You were you anointed. Cry on Easter. <laughs> you were anointed. You knew you were special as a young kid and you knew it wasn't going to be easy, but you were unstoppable. You had a driving oh. force. And there is a lesson that's hugely inspirational for people. And thirdly, you triumphed. You proved that your dreams, no matter how big they are, actually can come true. And I happen to think that wow. there's a huge value to reading a memoir like that. It's not that I haven't been offered. I just, I don't know. It just seems sort of gross to, you know. Uh, it's no, funny. and I know how it should happen. Oh. You need to be interviewed. I don't see you sitting down and writing it all. I think you're oh. such a raconteur and these stories are so fresh. You just need someone to pull them out of you. And I'm volunteering for the job. Oh, well, you know, who's going to watch this is Lisa Sharkey at, at uh, HarperCollins. So Lisa, l listen to this. <laughs> yeah. I have so, so enjoyed meeting you I, and talking Thank about you. your amazing career. I'm very flattered that you're even interested in my career in life. But you brought up a lot of stuff today. Like, I'm going to have a rough day today. <clears throat> just like unearthing all this stuff because... I don't know, like, A, where did the time go? And it's like a time compression. But yeah, like, I am proud. I'm very, very, very proud. I think you should feel more than proud. I think you should feel triumphant. Mm. And I think you should feel valuable because what you do behind the scenes is very much appreciated by fans like me who see the nuances, who see the thought that went behind those productions and who appreciate what you bring to enhance the talent. No one in this business can do what you do, especially the way you do it. And also, there's an energy you give off. There's a positivity. I can feel it through the screen. And I think the world needs so much of it. So please don't have a sad day on my account because I'll <laughs> never forget our time together. I don't and think it'll be sad. I'm going to go have a drink now. But, you know, it's it's interesting hearing all this. And I, and I thank you very much for all those kind observations. But I will say this, and I'm positive about this. You're only as good as the people you work with and you surround yourself with. And that's a fact because you can't do it alone. You can't make greatness out of nothing, you know. And, and you know, it's uh, the stories are mine for sure. I have wonderful, wonderful stories. Well, if you're only as great as the people you work with, I feel pretty great today. Let me tell you, thank you for All taking right. the time to appear on our show. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'll look forward to, you know, hearing from people if they enjoyed this. I'm going to get that book out of you. <laughs> Lisa, take note, Lisa Sharkey at HarperCollins. Our guest has been the one and only Richard J. Alexander. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Laurie Towers, my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK, and a very special thank you to Mark Sendroff. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.